Welcome to the continuing series of GT Global Canada's information cassettes. On this tape, we will join Derek Webb, Portfolio Manager, Canada RSP class. I want to thank you all for coming this afternoon. I know it's been a little bit crazy, and uh, hopefully I can shed some light on what's going on here. You know, anybody's in the back, why don't you just have a seat, because I'm afraid if you don't, you'll probably leave, so. <laughs> I know I wouldn't want to stand up for the next 20 minutes. What I want to do this afternoon, because we have a fair amount of ground to cover here, is I want to cover three things. First, I want to talk about the markets, specifically as it relates to the referendum. Obviously, it's the thing that's probably the most on your mind right now. Secondly, I want to talk, and this is the real reason what we want to talk about this afternoon, is the way in which we are running this fund. To the best of my knowledge, to the best of our knowledge, nobody in Canada is running a fund this way. And it's a process that we use in the U.S., and it's been very, very successful. We've tested it here in Canada, and it appears that it will work very successfully here. So I want to explain the process to you. And lastly, I want to talk about just macroeconomics in Canada and how attractive Canada is, ex the referendum, uh, on a global basis. All right, first, let's talk about the referendum. We felt going into this week that the Canadian market did not price correctly the possibility that there would be a yes vote on the Quebec issue. We very much hope it's going to be a no vote, but on a risk-reward basis, we felt for some reason the market was ignoring this. The reason, we don't know. We have, because of that though, we have kept 30% of the fund in cash and as Joe alluded to, we always, always, always have 20% of this fund invested abroad. Therefore, right now, we only have 50% in Canada. And let me just take you through the thinking of why we did this. First, if there is a yes vote, obviously cash is going to be king. Foreigners are the main drivers of equity prices in Canada, and I will show you a graph that shows that very clearly. And if there's a yes vote, foreigners are going to back away from Canada until they figure out what's going on here. There's a lot of things that have to be decided if it was a yes vote as far as who gets the debt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So cash is going to be king. The market would probably be oversold, and we would be in a position to put that cash to work. If the vote is no, which is, of course, what we hope it's going to be, um, then we will put the cash to work immediately Tuesday morning. We might miss the first 50 points. We don't know what we'll miss, but we think it'll be very small. And on a risk-adjusted basis, we think we're doing our clients a huge service to be prudent because if there's a yes, we think the downside is going to be a lot greater than the upside if there's a no. So that's why we have a 30% cash position right now and we think we've done the prudent and the right thing. Okay, I don't want to talk more about the referendum because obviously none of us know how the vote's going to go, but I just want to let you into how we are positioned right now. Let's talk about how we manage this fund because I think that's really the exciting exciting thing here, and we can talk more about the referendum afterwards if you want to ask questions. All right, in the U.S., um, we have a strategy that works extremely well, and it's produced some incredible returns, and it uses these four variables that are right up here. When Joe asked me if I'd run a Canadian fund, I said, Joe, I will only do it if I think I can beat the index and if we can be a top-performing fund. And the reason I said that is because in the U.S., we've developed strategies that have allowed us to perform extremely well, and I only wanted to do it, manage this fund in Canada if I thought I could do the same here. In the U.S., a fund that we, we manage that employs these four criteria right here, investing in U.S. stocks this year has produced returns of about 60%. And over time, if you just back test it, i.e. you just throw in these four variables and pick stocks using these four variables, over the last 10 years would have produced returns somewhere about 48% a year, which is really quite staggering. We're not the only ones who are doing this. There are other people out there that are doing this. Richard Dryhouse, 20th Century, AIM. There's only a handful of people, though. It's really what I call cutting-edge technology, if you will. So I sat down and I looked at the Canadian market, and we really did quite an academic study saying, what really works in Canada? How do you really make great returns in this market, similar to what we did in the U.S.? You know, everybody thinks they're a great stock picker, but at the end of the day, what's the proof in the pudding? What absolutely works? And what we found quite interesting was that the Canadian market works exactly like the U.S., almost, in the sense that these four variables are the ones that are the most important. They happen to be the most important in the U.S. If you stick to these four variables, you can produce some, quite some staggering returns. Let me go through these variables just to explain how we, how we use these. 
first. And I should say, what we do is we get all this information electronically from every brokerage firm in Canada, it comes into our offices, and that's how we get all this information. And it's something that most people don't have. It's a service we put together, and it's been quite productive for us. First, we only buy stocks that have very strong earnings revisions. We screen the entire TSC every two weeks, all 300 stocks, and we own those stocks where analysts are raising their numbers, increasing their earnings the most significantly. Those are the stocks in Canada now that are doing better than the market, if you will. These are the businesses that are improving faster than analysts think they're doing. And those are the stocks you want to, want to own because as earnings go higher, of course, if you believe in PEs, which we do, the stock price goes higher. So you want to own those stocks where consensus earnings, and it's important not to just to look at your own firm's earnings, because if the analyst at your firm is taking his numbers down, but the market's taking his numbers up, even if he's right, chances are that stock is going to follow the consensus. So it's very important to look at all the consensus earnings. So first, we look at those stocks where earnings are being revised the fastest upwards, and those are the ones we focus on. Secondly, we want the stocks to have an earnings surprise. If a stock surprises last quarter on the positive side, guess what? It generally surprises the next quarter, and the next quarter, and the next quarter. We call it the cockroach theory, if you will. And generally, if a, if a stock surprises negatively one quarter, it surprises negatively a couple of other quarters as well. The reason being is that generally when there's a downturn in business, i.e. businesses are doing better or worse than expectations, they generally do it for a while. And analysts, of course, adjust their numbers based upon what happened that quarter. You see it all the time. Potash comes in with higher earnings. What do they do? They raise their numbers. What does the stock do? It goes up. That's what we look for. So earnings surprises is another thing that's very important to us. Earnings momentum, we want to own those stocks that have very strong earnings momentum. And really all that means is just that year over year, you have strong earnings growth. These are just the businesses that are growing the quickest in Canada. Lastly, relative strength. The first three you can see are all earnings driven. And that's really the way I think about that is those are the fundamentals of the business. That's fundamentally how is this company doing? But it's not just good enough to have a business that is doing fundamentally very well. And again, you all know this better than anybody. How many times have you bought a stock that fundamentally is a great company, but yet the stock just sits there and does nothing or goes down? I will guarantee you, if you go back to the day that you bought it and you look at the relative strength of that stock, it probably has a very, very poor relative strength. And basically what that means is just that the stock is doing better than the market. It's going up independent of the market. We want stocks that have strong investor sponsorship. These are the stocks that people love. These are the stocks that tend to do very, very well. And this is very important in good times and in bad. A great example is, for instance, this week. Stocks with high relative strength when the market goes down tend to hold up. And stocks with high relative strength when the market goes up tend to go up even further. This is just a starting point looking at all these for us. We screen the entire market every two weeks. We will only, only, only look at the top 30 stocks in there. And that's where we start our fundamental analysis. Unlike most people who are looking at maybe the, all 300 stocks and starting their analysis, we believe that these stocks are going to do the best, and that's where we start our analysis. And I should say, if you just bought a portfolio based upon those first four variables right there, over the last 10 years, that portfolio, just investing in the top 150 stocks in the TSC would have done 17.9% a year, and the TSC did roughly 7.5%. And the amazing thing to us was that not only could you beat the market by a huge margin, but the beta of that fund over that period of time was 1.02. It was basically the beta of the market. So we weren't investing in small stocks. We weren't taking a lot of risk. We were investing in large stocks at the right time and out of those stocks at the right time. And you could produce quite substantial returns. That's the way we run the fund. Now, fundamentally, we look for the following things at the bottom. And if they don't meet these criteria, we won't own them. We want to own those stocks that are going to benefit from the current macro environment. And in Canada, that is the most important because Canada has so many cyclical stocks. You have to know your natural resource markets, your commodity markets, et cetera. If it's not a commodity stock, we look for things that have superior products, services, or strategies, high returns on equity, low debt. And of course, we want to buy those stocks that have low PEs, i.e. are cheap. That's the way we run the Canadian portion. It's worked well in the past. We think it's going to work well in the future. Now, as Joe alluded to, we always, always, always have 20% of this fund foreign. And the reason is real simple, as he alluded. When you have the whole world to choose stocks from, it's just a lot easier to find better stocks outside of Canada within Canada. It doesn't have much to do with Canada, but you just have so many more stocks to choose from. What we look for in those stocks are basically the same things we look for in Canada. 
Stocks are going to benefit from the current macro environment. Great products, great services, great strategies, high return on equity and low debt. Let me just share with you some of the stocks that are in here right now. And I do this just to get a flavor for how great some companies really are in certain parts of the world. Our main holding in this fund, our biggest foreign holding year to date, has been Philip Morris, a boring tobacco company in the U.S. I don't know, does anybody know how much Philip Morris is up this year? 50%, and it has a 6% dividend yield. I mean, it's, the risk reward on this stock was incredible. Philip Morris is a business, just looking at it for one moment. It has a 48 average return on equity for the last five years. What that means is that for every dollar management reinvests back into this business, they get 48 cents back a year. It's just an unbelievable business. It generates four times as much cash flow as they need to run the business. What do they do with that cash? They've been increasing the dividend, they've been buying back stock, they've been paying down debt, and they'll do acquisitions. They bought General Foods, they bought 7-Up, they bought Miller Beer, and God knows what else they're going to buy in the future. The point is, this is an unbelievably profitable business and a cash flow machine. It only trades even right now at an 11 PE, and it has a 6% dividend yield. It continues to be a great stock of ours. Other stocks we have in there. Robert Mondavi, it's a wine company that's been growing very quickly for us. Continental Airlines, the airlines in Canada haven't been doing very well here, but we bought Continental Airlines just three months ago, and it's up almost 45%. Nokia, uh, a Finnish company, maker of Italian phones. This is the fastest growing maker of cellular phones in the world. Cellular phone growth is growing at roughly 50% a year, and this stock is growing its volumes at the same level. Fila, an Italian sporting good company. Aoyama Trading uh, is basically a, it's like the Walmart of Japan, if you will. Walmart, Zellers, is a concept that was just introduced in Japan two years ago, as hard as that is to believe. The reason for it has to do with distributors locking people out of the market. Long story short, their sales have been growing at 50% a year. So when we're looking at countries, the countries we want to own are those countries with superior GMP growth, undervalued markets, and where we see positive change in monetary and fiscal policies. I should say that this year, we've had, of the 20%, we've had almost 18% of that in the U.S. And the reason being, it's just been a great place to make money. We've been moving out of the U.S. Right now, we only have 10% in the U.S., and we have roughly 5% in Europe and 5% in Asia. One of the other things we also always do in this fund and it's the nice thing about managing a fund that's a little bit smaller, is that we can put IPOs in here. And GT is a big firm worldwide. We have a lot of clout, and there's a very hot IPO market going on around the world. It's been actually taking place for about the last five years. When we can find IPOs where we know they're hugely oversubscribed, we will always get in them. Well, I basically call it free money. Because we're a big firm, we can wait almost till the day before, knowing how hot the deal is, go in and get our allocation. And in a fund like this, we can get pretty decent allocations. Some of the things we've done there this year are stocks like Netscape, which was up over 100% the first day, Philippine Telecom, which was up about 25% the first day, Oakley Sunglasses, it's, they make sunglasses, 20, that was up 100% the first day, Red Hook Beer, which was up about 75% the first week. We will always do these and we can find those. Last Friday, we bought an Italian sunglass company in here called Dorigo. This company has a 60% return on equity for the last three years. It's been growing sales at roughly 30 to 40% a year. This deal was 10 times oversubscribed. It only came with a PE multiple of 12 times. They wanted to have a great launch on this one. We've made about 15% on that stock in, in the last two days. Gucci, we got yesterday. Uh, we actually had a great allocation on this one. It was better than I had expected. It was a 5% allocation in the fund. Um, again, the deal was about seven times oversubscribed, and we made 25% on that yesterday. Um, the point is, when we can find these, we will always do them because it's great risk reward. Let's talk about Canada for a minute. And again, um, this is post-referendum and this is just looking at the economics of Canada, forgetting all the political factors because we can't predict those. Canadian GNP growth, 3% next year. That is one of the highest in the G7. It's interesting to put that in perspective. Canada's U.S is GNP growth next year is only supposed to be between two and a two and a half percent. Canada is going to have one of the highest GNP growths anywhere in the industrial world next year. And it's mainly because of the natural resource sector. But the nice thing is that growth isn't too fast. It's just the kind of growth you want. It's moderate economic growth. The second thing that's great about Canada it has very, very low inflation. It's roughly two percent right now, which is also one of the lowest inflation rates in the G7. Low inflation, moderate economic growth is the recipe for higher equity prices. We expect interest rates to decline post-referendum, obviously assuming it's a no, the dollar to strengthen. The most important thing, though, in our opinion, that's going on in Canada right now 
is the fifth bullet point down here. The Canadian dollar for the last three years has been terribly weak, obviously. And the reason it's been weak, in our opinion, is because of the fiscal and monetary situation here. Excuse me, the fiscal situation on both a federal and provincial level. It's been a mess. The government's been absolutely out of control, and every international investor knows that. It's not because of Quebec. It's not what's been going on there. This week, it's because of Quebec. But that has been the main problem with Canada. That is why this market has been so anemic. That's what foreigners have been worried about. If Canada changes that, which it appears to be doing right now, the market will do very, very well. That's the good news, is that the change is really what investors want. We're seeing a change. Hopefully, it will continue, and that will really help Canada dramatically in the TSE. The result of all this is obviously foreigners have been hugely underweighted Canada. If you look at valuation on Canada, this is absolutely the most compelling reason for the TSE. And all these numbers have changed. We did this last week, and so now it's even cheaper, of course, than it was last week. But just look at these numbers. They're really quite, quite staggering. Canadian real long, long yields are over 6% right now. These are real yields on the 10-year. These are the highest real yields anywhere in the industrialized world. You have to go to the emerging markets to get these kind of yields somewhere else. You have to go to a third world country. Very, very cheap. Our bond guys are double weighted in Canada right now, and they'd love to increase their weighting even more. They're going to obviously weight post-referendum like every, every other foreigner is doing. But the reality is everybody knows this, and they want to own these bonds, assuming the correct vote happens. Canadian long yields spreads over the U.S. right now are about 180, 190 basis points. The average is 130. Again, bonds are very cheap. The stock market's incredibly cheap. The PE on this year, X gold, is 13 times. You have to take out gold because the U.S. doesn't have a lot of gold companies. The U.S. is 16 times. The most amazing thing, though, is that the TSC has underperformed the U.S. market this year by 25%. And to me, what's so amazing about that is 30% of Canadian GNP are exports directly to the United States. So theoretically, from an economic basis, these economies should track each other pretty well. And from the GNP growth, they have but yet the market hasn't. Foreign investors, they will be the catalyst to come back in and push it up. This just shows you the percent of exports as a percentage of Canadian GNP. And one thing you see is that it's just been rising over time. And of course, one of the reasons is the weaker dollar, which makes everything here more attractive. But the amazing thing is, 90% of those exports go to the United States. And what's more incredible to me is that the government here in Canada is almost 40% of GNP. Exports are 30%, which means the domestic economy is only 20% of GNP. It just shows you how important exports are, and of course, that's what's been driving the Canadian economy for the last two years. All right, this chart, I think, is by far the most important, and this just really tells it all as far as what's going to happen here with the TSC. The red line shows you the percent change in the TSC. The yellow line shows you the net buying and selling as a percent of the TSC total volume. And what you see is about a 90% correlation here. When foreigners are buying this market, they push it up. When they're selling this market, it goes down. Foreigners are the marginal buyer and seller of the Canadian market. They are the ones who determine the direction of the TSC. And you can see it very clearly right there. This year, they've been net sellers. They've actually been net sellers to the tune of about 1.5%, which is a big number in terms of what it does to an index. We believe, of course, if the referendum goes no, obviously they're going to come rushing back in. Everybody knows the value here, but everybody's standing on the sidelines. Okay, natural resources have been the area that's fueled the TSE in this, the last few years. We think it's the area that's going to continue to fuel it. What are the areas that we are concentrating on? On the left are the prices we think are going to go higher. On the right are the ones we think are going to go lower. We're focused right now on nickel, aluminum, paper, newsprint, liner board, pulp, all the fertilizers is actually the area I'm probably the most bullish on. Those are the areas we're focused on in Canada. Everything else, the ones in the middle we're neutral on, and the ones on the right, we expect prices to continue to go lower there. One of the things that's interesting is if you look where analysts, all the analysts in Canada think the growth is going to be next year, these people obviously spend all their days just looking at these companies. So it's interesting to see what the consensus, all 25 firms in Canada, where do they think the big earnings growth is going to be? And this is what you see. These are 96 earnings over 95. XL Gold, if you will, because every single year, if you look back historically, gold always shows this huge increase in earnings because every gold analyst thinks gold is going to go to $500 an ounce. So I just throw that one out. But what we see is conglomerates, forest products, and base metals. And the conglomerates are primarily natural resource companies. Those are your Brascans, your Narandas, 
The point is that that's where the most amount of earnings growth is supposed to come next year. Those are the companies and the areas that you want to focus on. Those are the areas that we're focused on. The other thing I want you to just gas glance at is the TSC earnings are expected to grow 17% next year. That's actually a very healthy growth as far as industrialized countries in the world. Uh, the S&P is only supposed to do 15% next year, to put that in perspective. Okay, lastly, let's just quickly just look at some of our favorite stocks in here. Potash Corp of Saskatchewan. This is a great company for two reasons. One, we expect potash prices to go higher, and two, they can increase volume. They are only operating at 60% of capacity. That means that other 40% volume can come online and all those earnings flow to the bottom line. And they don't have to go out and find it, look for it, drill for it. This isn't a mining company. It's just sitting in the ground. All they do is turn on the spigot, if you will. TD Bank, the banks have been getting crushed here, but it's important not to lose the fundamentals of what's going on in the banks. The reason they're down is just because of what's been going on with the referendum. Loan loss provisions have been declining dramatically in the banks, and fee income is up dramatically because of trading and uh, because of money, or money management services. Alliance Forest Products. The forest product stocks are the cheapest group of stocks in Canada. Forest product stocks in Canada also happen to be the cheapest group of forest product stocks in the world. To give you an idea of how cheap they are, on average, if you take the average of all the forest product stocks in Canada, operating cash flow to enterprise value, which means debt and equity, is three times. What that means is that if we in this room got together, pooled our money, and went out and bought these companies, we did a hostile takeover, we bought the stock, we retired the debt, our cash on cash return would be 33%, which is huge. And that's a lot cheaper than it is to go out and buy new plant capacity. And all the US companies are flush with cash because they've enjoyed the cycle like everybody else. We believe they're gonna come up to Canada and start buying a lot of these companies because it's a lot cheaper to buy these companies than go build new plant capacity. Bombardier, just a great company, a great product. One of the things we love in companies is when they have a product that consumers have to have, and they have one, it's the regional jet. And the reason that people have to have it is it saves the airlines a huge amount of money because it's smaller, you get a higher load factor, and every airline is trying to cut costs. The other thing is the rail car business is consolidated dramatically because Morrison Knudsen in the United States went out of business, and therefore they're cre increasing their market share, less competition. Suncor, I'm sure everybody in this room has lost money at some time in an oil and gas stock and knows how difficult it is to get it right. This is a great company because they get their oil out of tar sands. They don't have to go look for it. You don't have to worry about exploration risks here. This is like a factory of producing oil. Oil, co the cost of producing oil from tar sands has declined dramatically because of technology. These guys can, for every barrel of oil they produce, they generate enough cash flow to go out and produce two more barrels of oil. Incredible economics. Lastly, Asian Pacific Resources. This is a potash mine in Thailand. It's on the scale of the, the potash mines that exist in Western Canada. The beauty of this mine, though, is that they can land potash in India and China at 40% less than Campotex, all the Western producers in Canada, because they don't have to take it by train all the way across a continent and stick it in a ship and go across an ocean. In summary, I just want to say one thing. First, we have gone into this week being very cautious. The reason being is we felt the market did not correctly price in the possibility of a yes vote. We hope it's going to be no we felt it was prudent to have a large cash position, which is actually sitting in US dollars, I should say, and then a full foreign position. We're only 50% invested in Canada. If it's a no vote, we'll go right in on Monday, and we will buy, or excuse me, Tuesday. And if it's a yes vote, we'll be sitting pretty, and we'll wait till the market comes our way. We think it was the right risk-reward parameter. Secondly, the way we run this fund is a very disciplined fashion. It's a strategy we've been using in the US. It works incredibly well. It's a strategy that we've tested in the Canadian market and it appears to work very, very well. We're buying those stocks that historically should, if you look back, have been doing the best. They're the stocks that so far have been doing the best here. And we also fundamentally sit down and we really do our homework on all these stocks. I want to thank you very much. And I think uh, Mike's going to talk about telecom. Thank you. In the studio to share his thoughts with us today is guest analyst Derek Webb, Portfolio Manager, GT Global's Natural Resource and Consumer Products Funds. Derek will be here throughout the program offering us his insights. Darren Gibbs, let's now, turn to Derek Webb. Derek, good morning. Thank you for joining us again. Mark, thanks for inviting me. Uh, your view on the market in general? Well, we uh, have quite a bullish view on the market in the sense that I believe, like your guest yesterday, that markets are really going to track interest rates here going forward. So I think interest rates stay where they are, selective growth stocks go higher. 
I think interest rates pass over the 750 level, this market goes lower. And if interest rates continue down like they are right now, the market's going to go higher. So I think the markets are going to be driven by interest rates. Now, you run the GT Consumer Products Fund, which is up 47.4% year to date. You wouldn't lie to us about that, would you? No. no. All right. Got the numbers right there. And the natural resource, well, I've, I've, people put a lot of numbers in front of me, and they don't <laughs> always add up. GT Natural Resources Fund up 42.7% year to date. Canada Growth Fund up 42.2. America Growth Fund only 15.3. Nonetheless, this is a heck of a track record. And my question, I suppose, is, did you happen to be in the right place at the right time here? No, I was. Consumer products and natural resources. Canada Growth. You. you, you, you I'm not trying to criticize you. It just strikes me that you, these are, right now, very good areas to be in. Okay. Well, I would say that natural resources, unquestionably, has been a very good area to be in, if you're in the right sectors. Oil, gas, drillers have been a fabulous place to be. But interesting thing is that's only about half that fund. There's a lot of other areas in there, gold, et cetera, et cetera. Consumer products, I don't know necessarily that it's been a great place to be in. It's purely a stock-picking fund. I don't think necessarily the sector has done well. Mm -hmm. Some of the retailers have done quite well. Mm -hmm. And then Canada, as a market, has really not done that well. It's about track the U.S., and we own everything in that fund from natural resource stocks to t technology stocks, you know, the new bridges of the world and the cognoses of the world. So really, the reason we think we've done well is our discipline and our philosophy. Now, all right, let's get into your discipline for a minute or so, and, and we'll do this throughout the program, so don't worry. We'll, we'll get to most of the main points here. You look at uh, companies that are growing earnings the fastest, trailing 12 months earnings, and expected earnings per share over the next year, right? Correct. Okay. Does this mean you put a lot of faith in analysts, or is that simply the only number you've got and you've got to depend on them? Yes, we put a lot of faith in consensus analysts. We do not try to recreate the world. I don't try to go out there with my group and say, we're smarter than everybody else on Wall Street. The way we look at the world is we say, hey, a guy that's covering uh, potash at Goldman Sachs or covering IBM or whatever, he spends his whole life doing that, so he's a lot smarter than we're ever going to be at looking at those companies. So we shouldn't try to go out and recreate the wheel. We found that if you just manage what the consensus says, that's how you can find a lot of winners and substantially reduce risk. You also like high relative strength stocks. You buy, you buy high and sell higher. That's correct. Not the way you buy your groceries. All right. All right, we'll get into more of, uh, of the uh, uh, philosophy and tactics going on here with Derek and as we go along. Uh, so I want to get back to Derek uh, Webb again here for just a moment. Uh, we're kind of picking off little things in your investment philosophy. Uh, and this, I think, would be a good one, especially for the less experienced investors in our audience. And there are a good number of them who are just getting interested. You look for a P.E. that is below the earnings per share growth rate. Right. Explain that. Okay. Well, all we want to do is buy a stock where the P.E. is below its growth rate. So let's just take an example. We don't mind paying 30 times a P.E. of 30 times for a stock that's growing at 40% a year. We think that's a great bargain, if you will. But we don't want to pay a P.E. of 20 times for a stock that's growing at 10% a year. I think the big thing that a lot of investors confuse is they say, well, gee, a 20 P.E. is cheaper than a 30 P.E., but that's not true if the 20 P.E. is growing slower than the 30 P.E. If you will, the analogy I like to think, you know, Maserati's traded $150,000 a year, wherever they trade, and Chevy Nova's traded $8,000 a year, and it's for a reason. <laughs> stocks are no different. Fair enough. All right, up next, uh, Joe Kernan. More stocks to watch. Plus, we'll update... Huh? What? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. We're not going to break for the commercial ride. We're a little confused here because we've moved all the commercial breaks around, so we'll get back to you. All right. One of the things you pointed out to me before the program was in your natural resource fund, this company, Bree X Minerals, right. which trades, it's located in Canada, but its main property is in Indonesia. Yep. And the stock is up something like 200 times. It's, it's, it's the best performing stock that I know of anywhere in the world. Believe it or not, over the last two years, the stock is up 200 times, which is 20,000%. So that's, uh, what is it, $10,000 goes to $2 million. And yet you still find it reasonably yeah. priced. Amazing. Explain would, why. Okay. You wouldn't think a stock that's up 200 times would have a lot of value in it, if yeah. you will. But the simple math on Briex is the following. If you go out tomorrow and you buy Briex stock, you are paying $110 implicitly to get an ounce of gold in the ground. Now, it has 45 million ounces roughly right now. If you go out and buy American Barrick, Placer, Hamlo, Newmont, the other big gold companies in North America, you'd be paying $210 on average to get an ounce of gold in the ground. So you can buy the existing ounces of gold that they have at a 50% discount, and we believe, as do most analysts, that reserves will double from 45 million ounces to 100 million ounces. 
and that's a lot faster growth than the other big boys I talked about. So not only can you buy the existing reserves at a discount, i.e. value, you got more growth. But they are in Indonesia, so there's some political risk here. And is there product? You're talking about gold in the ground. Correct. I assume, though, that you're satisfied the difference is not completely made up by the production costs. You'll still come out ahead with 3X. Yeah, actually, because it's such a big mine, it's, it's, it is literally the biggest gold mine in the world, they're going to have the lowest production cost in the world. So actually, the amount you'd want to pay for each ounce of gold in the ground theoretically should be higher, forgetting the political risk. Symbol on this one is, uh, well, I, it actually trades on the NASDAQ now, but it's BXM on Toronto. BXM on Toronto. We'll be right back. Derek Webb, I believe you wanted to ask a question. Yeah, Charles, just out of curiosity, now you're in four different lines of businesses, urea, ammonia, potash, DAP. Just which markets are you the most bullish on? Well, for the short term, uh, nitrogen is, uh, is, is certainly the one that is getting the biggest pull. And wow. we're expanding our phosphate production also at our plant uh, in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Great. Hey, and just out of curiosity, now we've had Potash do a number of acquisitions. We've had IMC Global do a number of acquisitions. I guess independent companies out there now in the fertilizer business that are not the big behemoths, we don't have many left. We have Agrium, I guess we have Sherit, and we have yourselves. Is that right? Uh, well, you have Terra. Terra. Uh, out there, and then you have the uh, two large uh, farm cooperatives uh, out there. But, but yes. Uh, your premise is correct. Do you think the industry will continue to consolidate? Well, I don't think a lot more consolidation will occur. So uh, let's turn back to Derek. Uh, Derek, you've mentioned gold. Let's just put a cap on that. Uh, your gold choices don't depend on the price of the bullion? No. We're not, we're not bullish on the price of gold. Haven't been for the last few years. Uh, we just think it's too hard of a market to call. I mean, the bottom line with gold is, to me, the only time it should go up if it, is if you have monetary inflation. Currency of last resort. We're in an environment where inflation is very much under control. Central banks all over the world are doing a fabulous job. You want to be in stock markets, you want to be in bond markets, you don't want to be in gold, so we're not bullish on the price of gold. But it doesn't mean you can't make great money in gold stocks. There's lots and lots of high growth gold stocks, and that's what we buy. Yeah, you're looking at the business aspect and not the gold aspect. Yeah, we don't try to guess the commodity prices. We don't think anybody gets it right. It's too hard a game. And if you invest in the high growth companies, you can do extremely well. Yeah, all right, fair enough. Uh, more from Derek as we go along. Also, Get back to uh, Derek Webb. Uh, Derek, we've talked about the, uh, the natural resources. I you have this Canada growth fund, which has also done extremely well, but that's not one thinks of natural resources when one thinks of Canada. But you have a very uh, optimistic outlook about the entire nation. Explain. Of Canada. Yeah. yeah. Basically, Canada, what's going on there is that it was, the way I like to think about it, it was a bit of a socialist country before. Government was out of control. The deficit as a percent of GDP was actually one of the highest in the world two years ago. It was almost 8% of GDP. But the amazing thing is the Canadian government realized they had a big problem. The currency was going down. They had to issue too many bonds, similar to what's going on here. And they finally have turned the thing around, what hopefully we'll be able to do in this country someday. And they've reduced the deficit to 2% of GDP. Uh, and they think they'll go to actually a balanced budget, which hopefully we'll get to in this country, by 1999. They're actually ahead of schedule, so both on the federal level on the provincial level, which are like their states, they've been reducing deficits, they've been cleaning up their act. And he, I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I'll finish your thought. Well, what, it, what it's happened is that, so investors now, which kept away from the market before, now are turning back into the market because they're seeing the government turn their act around. And real rates of interest there are very, very high. They're roughly 6.5%, long bond trades, about 8%. Inflation's actually lower than the U.S. at 1.5%. So you get about a 65 real rate of return. Compared to the U.S., long bond here, about 7%. Inflation running about 3%, 4% real rate of return. So people like ourselves are rushing in the market. In your list of uh, your top holdings here in the Canada Growth Fund, uh, it really, I see three main areas represented here. One, obviously, the natural resources. You've got uh, Berkeley Petroleum, Berkeley Petroleum and uh, people like that. But the other is high tech. A lot of high tech firms in Canada worth paying attention to you. To yeah. Inter interesting statistic about the Canadian market. I think on a per capita basis, actually, Canadians are probably more advanced technologically than the U.S. You think of the U.S. as the technology center of the world. The University of Waterloo, which is kind of their main technology university up there, Microsoft hires more people from that university than any university in the world. And they have their own little Silicon Valley. It's up in Ottawa, and there's a lot of great companies that come out of there. Some of the companies that we like in particular right now are things like Newbridge Networks, a networking company similar to Cisco or Cascade. Uh, making the same kind of things, primarily for the local area network. Northern Telecom, big maker of telecom equipment, 
Cognos, uh, a maker of software that allows your PC to talk with a Unix um, server. And actually a company that's a really amazing company is one called Leech Technologies. And uh, probably everything in this studio right here is made with Leech equipment. What they do is they turn analog video signals into digital video signals. And of course this whole industry is going to digital from analog. They're the biggest player in that market. L-E-I-T-C-H, Leech Technologies. Ex exactly. Do you have another symbol on that one? I know you don't. It's LTV in Canada. LTV. Uh, and I don't know if they have a NASDAQ listing yet. Newbridge is at 68 and a quarter, 52 week high, 74. Would you still be a buyer at these levels? Yeah, we see numbers going higher. What we look at is one thing. We look at the earnings numbers, i.e., what did they do last quarter? They beat last quarter by a penny. Not a big blowout quarter, but not a bad quarter. Uh, they're growing about 30% a year right now. And we keep seeing analysts raising their numbers, both in Canada and the U.S. analysts that cover the stock. Those are things we look for. So, yes, we'd still be a buyer. It's right. one of the cheaper networking stocks, actually, out there right now. Okay, fair enough. The old uh, P.E. to growth rate uh, rule again. Gotcha. And thanks also to our special guest, Derek Webb, GT Global. Derek, good to see you. Hope to see you again in a few weeks. Thanks also to all of yours. We Derek Webb. Derek is GT Global. This is Wan Yu, Gigam Zaptun. 就需要找一個專業又信得過的人來幫你刘徐玉晶提供。各位观众，你哋好，我系刘徐玉晶。今日一九九六年三月三号，今日我高兴请到一位嘉宾嚟接受我哋访问。咁佢个名咧就叫 Derek Webb。咁 Derek 咧系 GD Global 支持环宇基金集团嘅基金经理。咁啊，环宇咧系国际性好有名嘅基金公司嚟噶。咁佢管理咧嘅資產咧係達到有七百億加元咁多嘅。咁 Derek 咧係三藩市咧特登飛嚟接受我哋訪問嘅。咁佢而家管理咧 GT Global 嘅 Natural Resources Fund 天然資源，同埋咧就 Worldwide Canada Worldwide RSP Fund 即係加拿大嘅退休金。咁我睇下佢咧有咩投資嘅心得，同埋睇下睇市場有點樣睇法。咁隔坐喺隔離咧就係我哋嘅朋友就係 Gelvin Lu。咁 Gelvin 咧亦都係 GT Global 嘅同事嚟噶，咁佢咧一間會咧將中文翻譯。Darren Gelvin, welcome you to Fairchild Television. Thank you very much for inviting us. And um, I understand you manage the Canadian markets fund. And um, do you think the Canadian market is too high now? No, Doris. I think the Canadian market will go a lot higher. And the reason for that is inflation is low, interest rates are low, economic growth is moderate, and that's the recipe for higher equity prices. 咁頭先 Doris 咧就問阿 Derek 咧，對於加拿大嘅市場而家點睇啊？認為係咪而家個價位太高咧？咁阿 Derek 咧就話唔係嘅，現時加拿大嘅股票市場咧，亦都真係唔算高。由於咧加拿大嘅低通脹啦，個利息又低，咁咧同埋有持續嘅增長咧，係會令到加拿大嘅股票咧有上升嘅趨勢嘅。So Derek, what is your investment philosophy? Doris, the way we run the fund is 60% of it is invested in a core philosophy that has historically produced returns in Canada of 20% a year. Versus eight percent for the market, twenty percent is in special situations, and twenty percent is invested abroad. 咁頭先 Doris 咧就問阿 Derek 咧佢嘅投資嘅策略係點？咁我哋基阿 Derek 咧就話咧，我哋公司嘅誒基金咧就會將六成咧就會投資喺加拿大嘅股票上面啦，兩成咧就會投資喺啊一啲特別嘅情況，好似係啲咁嘅啊礦產業股票啊，或者係啊啲收購嘅誒情況嘅。咁另外二十 percent 咧就會投資咧喺海外。So, Derek, when would you decide to buy it? Doris, what we look for when we buy a stock for the 60% of the core portfolio is we look for four things. We want the companies to be the fastest growing companies in Canada. We want them to be growing profits or earnings faster than expectations. We want the analysts to be raising their profit expectations for those companies. And lastly, we want all that good news reflected in the price of the stock so the stock is going up more than the market. 咁頭先阿 Doris 咧就問阿 Derek 咧，誒佢會點樣去揀啲股票噶？咁咧阿 Derek 咧就話咧，我哋主要咧就係用四大嘅準則去去揀啲股票。第一個咧就係收益盈餘咧係高過分析家嘅預算啦。第二樣咧就係盈餘嘅收入咧係誒啊
比較好嘅。咁第三樣咧就係話咧，佢嘅升幅比市場嘅升幅更加大。咁仲有一點咧就係話咧，盈餘咧係要啊、呃、有持續嘅增長。So when we decide to sell the stocks in? Well, the sell discipline is actually just the opposite of the buy discipline, and it's very disciplined. Anytime we see analysts lower their earnings expectations, we sell. Anytime we see profit growth slow down, we sell. Anytime we see a stock disappoint earnings, we sell. Or lastly, if the stock price starts to go down, we sell. 咁頭先 Doris 問啊 ，Derek 咧，我哋誒幾時咧就買拋售啲股票嘅？咁咧 ，Derek 咧就話咧，我哋公司咧就根據以上嘅頭先講過嗰四個誒嘅規則咧，就作一個相反嘅時候咧，我哋就會買啦。即係話咧，股價譬如跌啦。誒、uh, 或者佢嘅跌幅咧係比市場大啦，咁佢嘅收入盈餘咧係誒減慢啊，同埋咧佢嘅誒誒冇持續嘅增長能力咧，我哋就會拋售啲股票噶啦。So Derek, specifically, what do you like about the Canadian market? Well, Doris, let me talk about three areas that we like right now. One are the mutual fund companies. They're growing very quickly right now because interest rates are low and equity returns are high. Another area we like very much is technology. Canadians are some of the best technology providers in the world. Whether it's in telecommunications or software, two stocks we own right now are Hummingbird Communication and Cognos. And lastly, takeovers is an area we like very much. We've played six takeovers in the last year. We've made an average of 40 percent. Three takeovers we're playing right now are Diamond Fields, CFCF, and Noble China. 頭先 Doris 咧就問 Derek 咧點樣睇下特別喜歡加拿大嘅市場喎？咁咧 Derek 咧就話咧而家咧係 RSP season 啦。咁最喜歡嘅時候咧，第一個咧就係因為咧好多人咧都覺得利息係低啦，咁擺錢銀行咧就冇咁好啦。咁佢咧就會擺啲錢咧投資喺互惠基金度。咁第二樣咧 ，Derek 咧就講過咧就係佢中意譬如電信行業方面啦。咁我哋公司咧而家就係揸住個 Hummingbird 啊，同埋呢個。誒、uh, Cognos 嘅公司嘅，咁第三樣咧 ，Derek 講咧就係譬如收購嘅公司啦，我哋亦都有 Noble China 啊、CFCF 啊，同埋呢一個 Diamond Fields 嘅。So how about your foreign content? Well, Doris, we are a big believer in keeping foreign content right at the limit of 20 percent, which is allowed by the Canadian government. The reason for that is world indexes have done roughly 16 percent over the last 10 years, and the Toronto Stock Exchange has done half of that at roughly 8 percent. Areas we like right now are the United States, Japan, and Southeast Asia. 咁 Doris 咧就頭先問 Derek 咧，我哋呢個有關呢個加拿大基金嘅。咁啊 Derek 咧就話咧，加拿大我哋呢個基金咧有海外投資。咁我哋公公司呢一隻基金咧就會根據法例容許嘅限制上邊咧係去到二十個 percent。咁咧呢二十個 percent 裏邊咧，誒我哋咧就而家暫時投資喺誒意大利啊、誒香港啊、日本啊，同埋咧係美國方面嘅。嗯哼。And how about you? Do you have any? What's your opinion on gold? Well, gold, Doris, I'm actually not very bullish on. I know a lot of people are bullish on it right now. The reason I'm not bullish on gold is that I've gone back and looked at over the last 20 years why gold goes up, and gold only goes up when there's monetary inflation. And right now, there's no monetary inflation in the world, so I don't see a reason for gold to go up. 咁頭先咧 ，Derek 啊 ，Doris 咧就問 Derek 咧對金價點樣睇嘅。咁咧，啊 Derek 就話咧。通常咧，一般情形之下咧，誒金價只會上升咧，就係由於咧呢個誒高通脹啦，誒貨幣貶值啊，同埋係咧呢個債券市場誒暴跌咧，令到投資者失去信心。咁根據現時咧誒目前嘅市場嚟睇咧，誒 Derek 咧都認為咧金價咧係唔會誒上升得好多嘅。So what is your opinion on the resource sector? Well, I'm very bullish actually on the resource sector. Um, one again, the things that Canadians are very, very good at is going around the world and finding mineral deposits in other parts of the world. And this is one of the key areas we invest in. Right now, we own Briax, a gold company in Indonesia, which has gone from $60 a share to $50. We own Kajistan Minerals, which is another mining property in the Republic of Kajistan in the former Soviet Union. And this stock has gone from $5 to $15. And lastly, we own Abakan Resources, which is an oil company in Nigeria. In addition, we like uranium in Cameco, and we like fertilizer stocks. We like Agrium and Asian Pacific Resources. 咁頭先啊 ，Doris 咧問阿 Derek 咧對天然資源行業咧係邊一啲特別睇好嘅？咁啊 ，Derek 咧就話佢咧就特別睇好有幾誒，譬如有呢個礦產業啊、油嘅公司同埋呢個樂嘅公司。咁我哋咧就誒頭先啊 ，Derek 都有 mention 過啦，就話呢個 mining 嘅公司就係有 Briex 啦，佢哋由六十蚊買入，而家去到一百五十蚊。啊 ，Albertan 呢間油嘅公司咧由四蚊升到十一蚊。同埋咧，我哋又有誒誒 Comico 啦，呢一間係 Uranium 公司，同埋誒呢個肥料嘅公司就係有呢個誒 Asia Pacific 同埋 Agrium 嘅。Since you know we have only half a minute to go, and how about you see the resource sector is doing well? How about what do you think of the inflation and how does it affect the interest rate? Well, Doris, I actually expect inflation to remain low. 
And the reason is wages are going down. And even though resource prices might go up, resources are a very small part of, of inflation. They're only 18%. So I expect inflation to remain low, and therefore I expect interest rates to remain low. 咁頭先 Doris 問阿 Derek 啦，究竟天然資源個價格會唔上升，同埋會唔影響通脹啊？咁其實天然資源咧，只不過係佔於誒消費物價指數十八個 percent， 而咧呢個誒工資咧係佔咗五十個 percent。咁而家全世界嚟講咧，工資都係比較偏低，咁所以咧佢哋咧係唔會有影響到通脹嘅。Thank you, thank you for the information, and we'll see you again. Thank you very much, Doris. Thank you. Thank you. And 誒而家時間差唔多啦，我係劉徐耀晶，多謝貴睇投資心得節目，下個星期同樣時間再見，拜拜。Bye. Tax Sum Up 係由代理制定個人投資策略嘅利是證券董事兼副總裁劉徐玉晶提供。Let's turn back to our guest, Derek Webb of Chancellor LGT. Is that, have I got that right? You, you're perfect. Okay, and the L stands for the Prince of Liechtenstein. Stands for Liechtenstein, exactly. Okay. This is the prince. This is not the man formerly known as the Prince of Liechtenstein. No, this is the official Prince okay. of Liechtenstein. Nice, okay. Nicest prince I've ever met. <laughs> Which includes a long line of princes. Which includes all those friends of mine that are princes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's... Uh, Let's see how you stand on a few things, Derek, that uh, you went on a record uh, about and find out whether you've changed your mind or anything. In uh, early November when you were on, you liked Nike, said it had fallen for no, were recently for no reason. It was 57 and change, now it's at 61 and change. It's a nice pop in just a month or so. Um, you also like Briex Minerals. Now there's been a lot of news about this company. The stock has, it was 17 and change when you liked it. Last time in October, it's now uh, around 16, so it has declined. But have you changed your mind? Because there have been developments in terms of right. uh, in the Indonesia situation. Let me, let me first address Nike, and then I'll go to Briex. Okay. Um, Nike, we have liked all along here because we thought that they would be growing faster than expectations, producing positive earnings surprises. Mm -hmm. In fact, they just announced their quarter last week. It was an absolute blowout quarter. Yep. Uh, numbers have gone a lot higher. Interesting to note, the real thing that Wall Street was looking at was the back order number i.e. what have people ordered going forward and that number was in the 54 percent level where the street was looking at something in the high 30s so that just shows again how strong nike's business is going forward so we continue to be very bullish on nike mm -hmm. interesting to note coke trades at a 29 pe on 97 nike trades at a 17 so i don't know whether you can compare the two franchises but i think it's important to note there the other thing um Briex minerals last time i was on the program i was very bullish on that uh, I thought that somebody would probably do a deal with them to try and take them out. Just to refresh memories here, Briax is the largest gold mine in the world that was discovered two years ago in Indonesia. Right. Right now it has 57 million ounces. But what's been going on over the last month is that uh, American Barrick, which is the largest gold mining company in North America, uh, which only has about 45 million ounces, but it's actually producing, that's why it's the largest, they are in the process of trying to do a deal with the Indonesian government and Briax to acquire uh, that property. The Indonesian government wants somebody who has the manufacturing ability. It's my understanding, and yep. correct me if I'm wrong. So Briax is kind of under the gun to do a deal. Yeah, the Barrick is, is, is coming in and trying to do it. it it's, it's almost a little bit like a soap opera here in yep. that Briax has this huge gold deposit, and it was a bunch of guys from Alberta, Canada that discovered it. The problem is they don't have the billion dollars of capital to go out and develop it. So Briax comes in as the white knight to the Indonesian government. Barrick, says, rather. Excuse me. Barrick comes in and says, gee, guys, we can develop this for you. We have the money. We have the financing. Give us a significant stake in the deposit. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that for Briax shareholders, they're getting crammed down because the stronger white knight, in a sense, for the government is coming in and saying, we want to do a deal. Mm -hmm. The rumors right now are roughly that they're going to take about 70% of the deposit, which they will pay for, but nobody knows what the price they'll pay for it is. It's also expected that the government will take part of that deposit. Okay, so how do you feel about the stock today? I still feel very bullish about it. I think we're going to hear an announcement. Actually, today's the day uh, people are speculating we're going to hear an announcement, but news here has been very sketchy. We know the following things. A, the government wants a deal done, and they want a deal done by the end of the year. B, we know that Barrick wants to get into the property. And for Barrick, any deal they do, it will be highly accretive. Mm -hmm. 
because Barrick stock trades at about 200 market cap per reserve ounce. Briex stock trades at about 70. So if they acquire this, it's highly accretive. And C, and most importantly, on American Barracks board, you have George Bush, um, you have Brian Mulroney, you have George Baker, uh, and Peter Monk, who actually runs the company. They're all, if you will, global diplomats. So I think they'll give a fair price to the stock. Okay. Let's get over to Joe Kernan's desk, find out what he's watching. Joe. I, I wanted to ask Derek quickly. Derek, we already had an announcement on this, and then later the same day it came out, we didn't have an announcement on this. This is like... It's what, been a soap opera. What can you believe? And has it got anything to do with the Indonesian government? Ten percent's not bad either for just, for just sitting there, right? I mean, they don't have to develop anything, do they? There is no doubt that what's going on here with the Indonesian government um, makes investors skittish. You hear one thing one week, you hear another thing the, ne the next week. The problem is that it's the problem with investing in the third world. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of politics here. Uh, actually, it's interesting to note that BRIAX, knowing that they needed to somehow secure their deposit and secure their work permits, went and did a deal with the son of the president of Indonesia. And then there's the daughters involved too, right? Then, she's, yeah. she's aligned with someone else. It's, it's then, classic. Exactly. Then Barrick went and did a deal with the daughter and they're all trying to get in and get the deposit here. It really, whoever gets the book rights, this is I think the biggest winner. It's a gold rush. <laughs> it's a gold rush. Anyway, that, the symbol for people at home, if you want to do anything with this, uh, if you got a, an ADP, it's B, X, M is in mother, N is in Nancy, F is in Frank. You're not going to get it with that three-letter letter symbol that we showed. Right, Derek? That's exactly right. Trades on the NASDAQ here in the U.S. Indeed. Okay, I'm just going to go quickly here with, uh, with just to show you these stocks involved in this uh, bank. Derek? Hank, Derek Webb of uh, Chancellor LGT. Just curious what your long-term plans are for your company in the sense that, if I'm not mistaken, in the last quarter, your average selling price on steel was $520 per ton. Your average cost was roughly $500. Your operating profit per ton was about $20. Now, that's about half of Nucor or AK Steel. And in this very competitive environment, how can you expand those profit margins so you can get a decent return on equity and drive this company in the direction you want to go? Well, our costs are, are quite competitive, and I think your cost... And is it a Sparrow Point electric arc furnace? It is not. Sparrow Point's an integrated steel producer in a superb uh, water-based location in the Baltimore area. So can you, with Sparrow Point, for instance, an integrated mill, can you operate on the same cost basis as an electric arc furnace? The cost bases are different because an electric furnace uh, has as its principal raw material scrap, and of course... Uh, back to Derek Webb. Derek, we've held your feet to the fire on what you recommended before. We've talked to you about the overall market. What do you like now? Okay, well, I think one th real clear thing we're seeing in the market right at this moment is that what you've seen is a massive run-up in the big cap stocks. I mean, mm -hmm. the Dow here is just ripped right ahead of the NASDAQ. And I think the reason for that is that there's a lot of window dressing going on. It's interesting to note, if you look at the stocks that are really rallying, mm -hmm. you'd expect the earnings to be going up commensurately. That hasn't been the case. One 20 seconds. Okay. What do you like now? Okay, you want names? Yeah. Okay, I continue to like Nike. I continue to like Footstar as a company that was spun off. Uh, Footstar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's spun off from Melville Corp. It's actually aligned with Kmart, but their comp sales have been huge. Tiffany, we continue to like. Uh, the biggest sector I like the most are still the natural gas stocks, the oil stocks, and the oil service stocks. That's where we see the strongest earnings revisions. Okay. When we come back, we'll find out some names in those areas. Stay with us. All right, back to Derek Webb. Derek. You've been scribbling furiously, consulting your notes. Absolutely. Time to tell us what you like here in the energy sector. Okay, you're going to put my feet on the line here, so I've got to give you some specifics. Uh, the sector we continue to like the most is energy services, particularly offshore energy services. These are the oil drilling platform mm -hmm. companies. Names we like there right now are Marine Drilling, Global Marine, Rowane Drilling, and Atwood. In addition, high-growth E&P companies, companies that are growing the reserves and production of either oil or natural gas. Names we like there are Eni, which is a big, actually, Italian oil company that recently was privatized. It's How do you spell that? In the world. E N I, ticker symbol E on the NYSE. Ticker symbol is E. Just plain E. Just plain E. On the big board. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Those Italians, you know, they get priorities on their tickers. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> uh, Comstock Resources, another one that just went on the big board, natural gas producer, Benton Oil and Gas, uh, producing oil and gas in Venezuela. Triton Oil, ticker symbol oil. You'll probably remember this one. Yep. And uh, Enterprise Oil, which trades in the UK, and Abacan Oil, which trades in Canada. What we're looking for in all those is very high growth in production and reserves. But of the two, you prefer the service firms. Why? Capacity situation? They're, they've dwindled and now there's so much business that everyone's doing well? Basically, what's going on with the oil service industry is you had all this equipment that was built in the late 70s and early 80s with the last oil shock. 
obviously people thought oil was going to go to forty dollars a barrel it never happened but that's what people built for so over the last fifteen years it's been just a doggy industry because you've had too much equipment so you've had way too low demand vis-a-vis -vis the amount of supply supply has dwindled down people have scrapped etc cetera, etc cetera. demands grown at two three percent a year last year supply and demand just crossed and so now what you're seeing is higher rental prices for all this equipment and we're still well below reinvestment rate for whether it's a uh, semi-submersible platform, jack-up platform, boats, etc. So you're well below reinvestment rate, so you can't add new supply. Demand is growing dramatically. Earnings are rising dramatically. That's why this group has done so well. We're bullish until you get to the reinvestment rate levels, which we're not there yet. Okay. Fair enough. You are just joining us. Today's guest analyst is Derek Webb, portfolio manager with Chancellor LGT Global. Uh, Derek Webb. Momentum isn't working right now. No, it's been a really interesting market. It's actually not just this year that it hasn't been working. Uh, in the fourth quarter of last year, it didn't work very well either. The classic things that work so well have worked so well uh, right now, which are, you know, the classic things that have worked, earnings revisions, earnings surprise, earnings growth, they just haven't been working for four months. It's been a very interesting market in that the market just seems to be buying the big stocks. It's almost like everybody's scared and is just running to the big stocks. Those are the ones that are going higher. People really aren't paying a lot of attention to the fundamentals. Is it creating bargains? Well, unquestionably, it's creating bargains. Now, one of the things that we do is we also look at the price action of the market because sometimes, even though you might think you're right on the underlying fundamentals, if the prices are going against you, to me, it is telling you something. Mm -hmm. So stocks are cheap, but we still are being defensive because the market is telling you that something's wrong with this. Um, momentum hasn't worked that well really since about July. Okay. Let's Thanks get to Mary Barbara Romo. Let's turn back to Derek Webb. Derek, you can make the case that based on interest rates, the PE of the market is not, not bad at all. Well, one of the things we look at is, and I think it's really important to do this, is you say, why has the market gone up as much as it has? Well, it's gone up because interest rates have gone down, because inflation's gone down, and because earnings have risen. Now, earnings growth isn't that exciting right now. It's running 10, 15% roughly for the market as a whole. But what is interesting is if you look at the market on a valuation base relative to inflation, which is what you need to look at, mm -hmm. the market doesn't look that expensive. And let me just give you an example here. In 1987, the market's peak PE was roughly 19 times. Today, the market is trading at roughly 19 times. That's this year's earnings. So on that alone, you'd say, gee, the market looks expensive. It looks like 1987. Maybe I should get out. The difference is, though, in 1987, inflation was running 4 to 4.5%. Today, it's running at roughly 3, 3.5%. Now, that doesn't sound like that big of a difference, but relative to the way the market trades based upon inflation, it looks a lot cheaper. If you do the math of dividing those two numbers, it tells you today, and I'm not saying this would happen, but that the market could trade it at a 27 PE multiple if it was at the same level as the market was trading in 87 vis-a-vis -vis inflation. So I think just a couple things are important is that inflation, as long as inflation remains low, the market should be going higher because the PE you have to look at relative to inflation not in a vacuum. You have low inflation, you get a high PE, you're willing to pay more for those earnings. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Uh, Derek. Jack, Derek Webb, Chancellor LGT. Hi, Derek. One of the things I like to look at is return on equity. And I'm curious, on your new boxes, what do you think your cash on cash well, return we, is? We look at around a 15% return, uh, internal rate of return, before we even uh, consider a new store for an opening. So, so, gonna, so in maturity, roughly, what's the cash on cash return? I, I don't have that number handy, but uh, if you want to call back at the office, we'll get it for you. Okay, because the interesting thing is if you look at the company's return on equity, it's somewhere below 10%, roughly speaking. Well, there's a reason for that. We've been reinvesting in our business, and that's what's kept us ahead. If you look at, at our gives. Derek Webb, how can you make a living in a market that is, that is composed at least half of the people in it are crazy? I mean, come on. <laughs> Alan Greenspan says... You know, Alan Greenspan talks about the market. It goes down 200 points because they all think he's knocking it. Now it's coming back because they all think he's saying it's okay. Alan Greenspan hasn't changed his mind. Nothing has changed. Talk to, talk to me about the oil service sector stocks. Well, I mean, that's an example of what we're talking about. Nothing has changed. They've been getting killed. I think one of the things that's really, that's really, really interesting. Yeah, yesterday we had a good bounce. But uh, one of the things that we just see is just massive volatility everywhere. It's kind of this game of almost like chicken right now. You know, technology stocks go up, they go down. The oil service stocks, I think, is one of my best examples of, again, what we look for, those companies that are growing earnings at dramatic rates, growing higher in expectations, producing positive earnings prizes. Now, the oil service stocks have all been doing that. In fact, it's still the group that we see of all the groups on Wall Street that are doing the best. 
but yet these stocks, some of them are down anywhere from 20 to 50 percent. Maybe because everyone who wants to buy them has? No. Maybe it's a liquidity well, problem? Well, that could be one reason, but what it is, is real simply, is the price of oil has come off from 26 down to about 21. The price of natural gas has come down from about 320 to about 180. So everybody's saying, sell all the stocks. And they sell the oil companies and the oil service stocks. Now the thing is, the oil service stocks have nothing to do in the short run with what the price of the commodity is doing. Because when you go out and you say, I'm going to do a big project in the Gulf of Mexico, or I'm going to do a big project in the North Sea, oil companies aren't looking what the price of oil is today, because mm -hmm. they're spending millions and millions of dollars. They base those projects on $19 oil you know, over a 30-year period. They don't really care about the commodity price in the short run, but yet that's not what Wall Street is paying attention to. So those stocks go down, which of course means they represent huge value. It's interesting to know, one of the other things that's interesting about, for instance, like oil service stocks, to use that as an example, is that to go out and build this equipment today, the rates don't justify building it. So you have a very good situation that you have rates rising, earnings rising, cash flow rising, but yet you can't build any new supply because rates aren't high enough yet to actually do that. And, and, and the other point on the, on the rig companies is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, these oil service companies are working on long-term contracts. If Shell suddenly decides, uh, oh, we've decided we don't want to drill this, uh, this uh, well, right. they can't bring the rig back to, to the company and say, never mind. I mean, they're committed, right? They're well, it, it, it's, it's a mixture, you're right. And actually, in a very strong environment like this, you actually want less commitment, not more commitment. Because your day rates are going up and you want more on the short term. Exactly. Yeah. So the, the, the whole point is that, yeah, it's that Wall Street doesn't really, at the moment, pay attention to a lot of the underlying fundamentals. We know that, and that's, of course, why markets aren't totally efficient, because they don't completely pay attention to the fundamentals at certain times, a la your Alan Greenspan argument. I, I, it's just, sorry. Yeah, oh, hey, can Joker. I, can I talk more? Can I get in here? They keep telling me you're not ready. No, I'm ready now. Oh, well, uh, you know, this little thing that I've got in my ear here, here it is, right here, that they kept saying, not, not yet. See, Joe's whether, not it's yet. In, whether it's in or not, you still hear voices. That's what really mm -hmm. scared me. The next door neighbor's dog, right? A guy named Sam. Anyway, uh, Derek, you know, yesterday, the what, what a huge rally. 10, 15 stocks all up four and five points based, I guess, on a, a piece in the journal. Is there a bottleneck in these oil service stocks? Is there not enough, uh, like, tubing or because they're so lean and mean now or because we're, there used to be 20 uh, companies in the business, there's five now. Is that true that if, if you really wanted to, to accelerate drilling, you couldn't do it right now? Well, it's interesting. I, of course, look at both oil companies, oil service, uh, all sorts of natural resource companies. And a lot of the oil companies have been disappointing recently because they can't get the equipment to actually go out and drill for oil and do the projects that they want to do. So yeah, there is a big bottleneck. Just the, the simple facts are, if you remember back to the end of the 70s, early 80s, everybody thought oil was going to go to $100 a barrel. Obviously it never happened, but yet the industry built the equipment for that to happen. Now what's happened is over the last 17 years, if you will, all this equipment's been sitting around, they've been scrapping it, and demand hasn't been that great. It's been going 1%, 2% a year, but supply's been going down, demand's been increasing. Last year across. Uh, that's why day rates are rising as dramatically as they are, and this is a multi-year cycle. Uh, a lot of people think that, if you will, uh, if you look at this cycle, uh, and you think about it in terms of a baseball game, which I know you guys like to think about a lot, uh, a lot of people have said, we're just singing the national anthem. Now, I'm not going to go out and say that, but the point is, we're still well below reinvestment rates, rates are going a lot higher, and it doesn't have a lot to do with commodity prices in the short run. Supposedly, if you wanted a deep water rig now, you could not rent one if, for any amount of money. Is that true? Well, either you couldn't rent one or you'd pay through the nose. I mean, very, very no, high rates. And that's why the rates are just going straight up. Hmm. And, and it takes, of course, it takes a long time to build one. Building one of these things is like building a skyscraper. I think it takes about 18 months, if I recall. We, we talked to some rig companies, and I asked that question. Right. I think it was um, what's going on in your natural resource fund? Believe it or not, I did get some email. <laughs> <laughs> you may have questions from uh, from a viewer on the natural resource fund, which is down 11.1 percent. Uh, what's your outlook there? Okay. Um, well, the reason it's down, first of all, let's let's start there. Is the oil service stocks we're talking about? Uh, when we look at everything out there. This is still the area that looks the fundamentally best to us. And Wall Street, though, has sold off these stocks anywhere from 25 to 50 percent. And uh, that is, in fact, why the fund is down. It's actually down about 9.5% because, as Joe because spoke you, about, yeah. we had the big rally yesterday. Um, so what is our outlook? Well, our outlook is the only thing we're bullish on, for, first of all, are the oil service stocks, not the oil-producing companies, because right. I do think oil and natural gas prices will go lower. Zinc um, and titanium 
And that's about it. And some specialty chemical companies. Some what about Canada? Well, Canada, we're bullish on the market. The market. But we have to look at the underlying fundamentals of each stocks. All right. We'll try. Like, I'm just, I'm curious, because I tend not to be that much of a value player, mm -hmm. though we want to have good valuations, but we want to have the momentum characteristics mm -hmm. that we believe drive stocks. Have you done any work on when small cap stocks, if you will, become so much more valuable than larger cap stocks? I'm sure it's cyclical. I've never read anything specifically on that, though. Yeah, very much. Uh, the small cap sector, the small cap value sector, comes in and out of favor for investors Can over time. Can you think time. of any reason why that might be happening? You know, I always look for, is something going on with interest rates, and theoretically why people want smaller than larger, or larger cap stocks have done well because of massive restructurings, where maybe small companies were always lean, so you're not getting the earnings changes. I mean, it's hard for me to look at this and try to figure out fundamentally why this disequilibrium has taken place. I don't maybe... Derek, there's, in the newspaper every day, we'll read something new about why small caps are underperforming or why they're outperforming. Derek, the we have 30 seconds in which you can explain to us why you own so many Canadian banks. Okay, uh, real simple. Banks, first of all, in the U.S. have been probably one of the best performing sectors. And the reason for that, real simply, is that they are making just tons and tons of money right now. They've cleaned out all their bad loans. you got a very steep yield curve. They're in all sorts of fee-related businesses. They're making lots of money. They have very high return on equity. They're buying back stock. That's in the U.S. In Canada, you see the same exact phenomenon. In fact, you see it going all over the world right now. The Canadian banks are cheaper than the U.S. banks. U.S. banks right now, this year, are trading 13, 14 times. Canada, they're still at 11. That's why. So, very strong and environment. And bullish on Canada itself. Canada, we're very bullish on because, just real simply, you have interest rates that are actually lower than the U.S. You have inflation that's much lower than the U.S., 1% versus roughly 3, 3.5% in the U.S. Uh, and valuations are a lot cheaper. In fact, you see the same thing in Europe, too lower interest rates, lower inflation, cheaper valuations. Okay. Thanks a lot to uh, get our guest analyst today, Derek Webb, Chancellor LGT. Uh, let's turn back to Derek Webb. Derek, you've, you've told us the small caps are where the value is, at least. Uh, where in the small cap universe? Let's start with the drillers. You know, Because the, the, uh, we were talking with Halder Marine about demand for offshore vessels and things like that. Uh, are they still on the uh, uh, reasonably a valued list as far as you're concerned? All right, well, let, let's look at, for instance, the drillers, if you will. Mm -hmm. One of the things we heard was that, hey, business is great, and it takes 30 months to build a rig. Now, one of the things Wall Street's worried about with the drilling stocks right now is that there's going to be too much supply, but we know supply roughly takes about 30 months. They're also worried about the demand side, thinking if hydrocarbon prices decline, oil companies won't have as much money to spend, mm -hmm. et cetera. Anyway, long story short, the drillers right now, your companies like Global Marine, Marine Drilling, um, and serve, et cetera, et cetera. They all trade on 98 about 12 times. So they're actually quite cheap. Now, the interesting thing is, if you assume that day rates stay where they are right now, and you look at, for instance, these stocks, and you look at the earnings that these companies will produce over the next two years as their um, rigs, which are on contract right now, come off contract and go to higher rates, right. you get some substantial earnings growth in these stocks. A lot of them still have 100% earnings growth in front of them. But Wall Street won't pay put a multiple on it, they certainly won't put a Microsoft multiple on it because they're worried that it could be the top of the market. Okay, so if you buy these things, you are in effect betting that it's not the top, that uh, the business will continue to go and that Wall Street is wrong. Exactly. And eventually we'll come to that realization and start bidding them up. Exactly. Any other areas uh, among small cap or any particular small cap stocks? Well, if, if you just look at in general, and we're not even talking small cap, I mean mid cap stocks, anything that isn't a Forrest Gump stock, anything that Forrest Gump can't name is cheap, literally. <laughs> I mean, it sounds pretty stupid, but it's pretty close to true. Um, just some things recently, a lot of things that I own are things like Jones New York, Interstate Bakeries. Jones New York makes all the Ralph Lauren things. Mm -hmm. Stocks doing very well. Ethan Allen. Interstate Bakeries has done, hasn't that done pretty well already? Yeah, it's done really well, but still, relative to what we're talking about with other stocks, it's still a very cheap stock. Mm -hmm. It's got a multiple that's below the market. So it's got room to go. Exactly. Similar uh, as IBC, I believe? Yeah, IBC, mm -hmm. exactly. New York Times, actually a uh, stock I like very, very much right now. Really? Yeah. Uh, basically what's going on there is that, well, as the economy continues to do well, their lineage continues to grow, advertising revenues continue to increase, and they have a lot of cash flow coming at them now because they just built that new plant somewhere around New York. I don't know if it's in Queens or where it is. Uh, but they stopped doing that, but they spent a lot of money over the last two years. Now all that cash is coming back and they can start paying out to shareholders, reducing debt. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, all the, all the newspaper stocks have been doing very well business-wise, and the stocks have been doing quite well as well. Got to stop you there for a moment. Okay. Got to gotta squeeze in a... This has been a huge drain on reserves uh, and enormous international tension. We'll have to wait till next week.
Derek, what's your interpretation of the crisis as, as it's been folding overnight? Obviously, it, you take a look at the international markets, especially the emerging markets. What's your interpretation in the sense that Mr. Yeltsin may have stepped down? Well, I think, Felicia, uh, as Mr. Brzezinski was saying, that clearly there's a, there is a very serious problem in regard to the Soviet Union. Now, we don't have any exposure there. We have felt that the recent run-up over the last year was really more of a house of cards. But I think as, as the world in total, or more specifically to the United States, I think we're seeing an overreaction in the market. I think that interest rates are going to have to fall because we're seeing disinflation or literally deflation. Um, so we are focused on the United States and on Europe. Continue to see this kind of crisis unfolding, not only in uh, Russia, but in the Latin American markets. And as we heard Mr. Brzezinski saying earlier, it's going to continue to play out in Japan and China. Is there a safe haven on the international marketplace? Well, we think the, the main safe haven is the United States, and when I say Europe, I mean both continental Europe and the U.K. One is that I think you have to be in either uh, treasuries and or the bonds in those respective countries and or you have to be in purely domestic-based um, companies. Because one thing that's very clear is that commodity prices are falling very, very dramatically. Because as all these other currencies melt down, their demand for, price, for commodities, which are priced in U.S. dollars, are falling. And that goes for industrial goods as well. So you've got to focus on those two markets and then be in things that are very defensive in nature. Derek, so do you buy into the fear that possibly Russia may be dumping oil onto the marketplace? We've already heard that they've been selling off their gold holdings. Well, clearly, Russia is actually the largest producer of oil in the world, which probably most people don't realize. And if you are running the Russian economy, that's the one thing you can push out into the world market. And the price of oil has gone up in Russia in domestic terms because it's priced in U.S. dollars. So i got to believe we're going to see more supply of oil coming into the world markets. All right. I want to thank you both for being with us. Steve Jonathan, Director of Foreign Exchange at Merrill Lynch, and also Derek Webb joining us, the Portfolio Manager at GT Global. Stocks on the no. NASDAQ. Derek Webb, what are you looking at? What, what, what areas are you looking at to find strong stocks these days? How about the energy sector? You were out on a drilling rig in the Gulf of Mexico. Talk about dedicated research. <laughs> It's pretty fun. It's the closest I'll ever get to being James Bond, landing in a helicopter on one of those things. Let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Where do you think the best pricing leverage for businesses is in any industry in the world right now? Well, drillers would certainly have to have a lot of it. Yeah. Um, the oil service industry, I, I, I sound like a broken record on this, but the bottom line here is that capacity utilization is at 100%. There's very few industries that are at 100%. It takes a long time to add capacity here. Interesting thing that I learned recently when I was down in Texas, which I didn't know before, is that people are very worried about adding new supply to this industry. But natural depletion of this equipment is running about 5% a year. Because if you remember, the last time anything was built in this industry was back in 1981. Because that's the last time anybody thought oil prices were going to go higher, and there was a lot of equipment built. So what you have is the newest equipment in this entire industry is 15 years old. Technologies move very quickly in this industry, so a lot of this stuff is pretty much behind the technology curve. It's depleting at 5% a year. So just to stay even, forgetting even gro any growth, you need to build about 5% new equipment a year. Right now, we're not even doing that. On top of that, it's interesting. If you look on Wall Street, everybody's been raising their oil consumption forecast globally. For the last five years, we were running about 1% to 1.5% global oil demand per year. Now it's at 3%. That is a huge, huge increase in oil demand. Hmm. Two thoughts occur to me as you spoke, and uh, one of them is, I, I think I might like to own the stock, if there are any, of people who build the oil rigs. Yeah. Since, And the other thing is, the drillers, it seems to me, then, are going to be not able to put a lot of, or some of that money can't be put in the bank, because they're going to they're gonna have to start making some capital expenditures here to stay competitive. Absolutely. Actually, I was in a yard in Mississippi where they were building a new, what they call a gorilla jack-up rig thing costs 200 million bucks. It goes out in 400 feet of water. Pretty impressive piece of technology. And these guys, everybody's building everything they can, but the backlogs now are totally filled and more and more stuff's coming in the pipeline. And let me interrupt you for a moment. Was this at a shipyard? Correct. So that, that's another factor that enters into this equation. We don't have as many shipyards as we did 15 years ago either. So there, there probably aren't as many people who can build these rigs as there were 15 years ago. There, there's, I'm they, sold. Yeah. Well, no, labor's at 100%. Welders are making, you know, I, I started thinking of quitting my job, going down and be a welder in Mississippi. These guys are making good money. Yeah. Um, and demand's going to go a lot higher. And the other thing that people don't think about is when you got a $200 million piece of equipment, 
and you got to build a lot of these things, there's bottlenecks and all sorts of things. So if you're missing one pump, one valve, one whatever, that rig can't go out until you have that piece of equipment. Name some companies you like. I like all the offshore drillers, which, you know, the, the Global Marines, the Falcon Drillings, the Diamond Offshores, the uh, Noble Drillings. I like the onshore guys. The onshore guys are just picking up right now where pricing is just starting to increase. And there you've got names like Patterson Drilling, Cliff Drilling, Gray Wolf, etc. The other area I like a lot is drill pipe. The guys who actually put the pipe in the ground when you drill an oil well. Prices there are up about 10%. It's the best performing part of the steel market. Who does that? Maverick Tube? Maverick Tube, Lone Star Industry, Tamza in Mexico, um, Prudential Steel in Canada. 100% uh, capacity utilization, prices going higher, and again, you don't build a steel factory overnight. The other interesting thing about that industry is that regular steel prices, because of all these electric arc furnaces that are coming online, look like prices are going to go down. Yeah. So prices go down for what they supply, and then what they push out the door, prices are going up, margins are expanding. Nice. Nice position to be in. All right. They don't have so to be programmers, but they should understand what it can and cannot do. Charles, question for you. Uh, I'm just curious. How much, if you will, respect do CIOs get? I look at our, my own business, and if I go to work and my technology guys aren't there, I can't do my job. My computer comes down one day. Uh, I can't see my quotes. I can't do whatever. You know, as I sat back, I thought about it. Probably the tech guy is the most important guy in our firm, but yet I wonder how often people realize that. I don't think most people realize the importance of what the plumbing or the infrastructure and what it's doing. Derek, uh, a lot of people used to play seasonal trends in the retail sector. They'd buy back to school, they'd buy Christmas, uh, they'd buy uh, summer. And some of those seasonal trends don't work as well as they used to. Can you still play them the same way as we did many years ago? Well, Ron, I don't, I don't know because I didn't play them that way a few years ago. But, <laughs> but okay. the, the, the bottom line is um, we don't try to play any seasonal trends. What we do is we really just look at three things in every retail stock that we own. We look for companies where they're accelerating their sales growth, where they're expanding their gross margins, and where they're reducing their SG&A. And we're finding lots of companies that are doing that. All right. Now, well, one of your picks, uh, Safeway, uh, is that uh, uh, on the list for those very fundamental reasons that you just described, or do you like the consolidation in that business that might lead uh, to a deal for that company? Well, we never break away from the fundamentals because you never know when a deal is going to actually happen. So. Yes, Safeway fits the parameters that I just talked about. And on top of that is the fact that you have very strong fundamentals, i.e., as you just alluded to, continued consolidation and continued amount of private label within their mix, which has higher margins. All right, let's go to the phones. Bill's on the line with us from New York. Bill, thanks for being with us today. Hi, I'd like to get your guest's opinion, please, on Bed, Bath, and Beyond. I would say it's, it's an excellent company. When you look at the fact that their store traffic is up about 21%, and the industry is up about 12. That's an outstanding performance. Very strong company. Uh, Derek, would you agree? Um, I would agree. It doesn't fit our model right now. Actually, we owned it over the last year. Unfortunately, we're very, very disciplined in how we own these things. I think fundamentally it's okay. We've seen positive earnings revisions, got a reasonable valuation. It just missed our model, though, so we had to sell it. Uh, just to, to clarify, your model suggests you sell it for what reason? Uh, what we saw in the case of Bed Bath & Beyond was we saw slight compression in the margins. We need three things in every retail stock. We need accelerating top line growth, we need expanding gross margins, and we need declining SG&A. So it's fairly disciplined. It keeps us in the winners and out of the losers. Right. Hey, Gunther's on the line. Yeah, go ahead, Derek. We, we actually own Kmart. Uh, fits our model perfectly. Accelerating sales, expanding margins, declining SG&A. All right. To the phones. Eric's on uh, the line. Home Depot looks like a buy right now. I was wanting to get your guys' take on that. How you feel? Derek? Uh, we own that. Fits the model perfectly. One of the things that's going on fundamentally there, why it works so well, is clearly the housing sector is one of the strongest sectors in the United States right now. I'd like to have the short and long term for family dollar stores. Yeah, we own the stock, fits our model perfectly. In fact, all the dollar stores fit our model. That'd be Family Dollar, Dollar Tree, Dollar General, all the discounters. Business very strong. Uh, I thought I hit a home run with PO one but it seems like I'm bunting. Yeah, you know, Derek, it's interesting because uh, after the Asian crisis, a lot of people suggested that you buy Pier 1 because its products uh, coming into the pipeline would be vastly cheaper thanks to Asian currency devaluations. But that play hasn't worked out quite as planned. Well, it's interesting you say that because uh, I was on Squawk Box and that was one of the picks that I had. Now, we had to sell that roughly four months ago. 
And the reason being is that it fell off the model, and the reason for that is top line growth has deaccelerated slightly. So uh, unfortunately, we've had to sell it because it doesn't fit the discipline. Theoretically, it should, but right now, sales are stagnating. Can't tell you why. We're back in the studio sharing his thoughts with us today as our guest analyst, Derek Webb, head of theme funds at GT Global. Let's take a second and replay the last time Derek was on. We thought small stocks would go higher, and uh, we've been right on both of those. We thought the larger stocks were overvalued. Um, clearly, the Russell 2000 has passed the Dow now. Um, we remain bullish on the market. We remain bullish on the stocks that are away from the index. We think they're going to go a lot higher. All right, that was a while ago. How do you feel about the market now? Well, I hate to sound like a broken record, but uh, bottom line is we still think inflation goes lower. Therefore, interest rates go lower. Therefore, stocks go higher. Interest rates go lower. We've got a long bond right now at uh, 588. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that? That's 38 basis points above overnight money. That's a pretty flat yield curve. How do, the, how do rates go lower? Well, we just, uh, the two, we just think mainly it's going to be driven by lower inflation. Why is inflation going to go lower? We think there's two reasons. One is the Bureau of Labor Statistics is going to start recalculating the way inflation is comprised. They're going to update it, if you will, start currently weighting it towards things that we use more. For instance, they're going to be putting things in like PCs and cellular phones, and they're going to market back, basket weight it more correctly. A lot of those prices have been declining. On top of that, you have the lower import prices. And on top of that, you just have this general decline in inflation that's going on. Are you not afraid that, that uh, lower interest rates, particularly with regard to the long bond, and I realize there are other rates that the market watches, short-term rates in particular, but let's take the long bond for a moment. Are you not afraid that, uh, that at some point a, a lower yield on the long bond might actually be taken as bad news by the market because it's pointing to a recession? Well, clearly, at some point, if interest rates get too low, we get in this you know, deflation, disinflationary cycle that people are worried about coming from over from Japan, that would be a problem. But we think the economy is strong enough that you're not going to have that problem, but yet you can still have lower inflation and therefore lower interest rates. I'm not saying that in interest rates are going to go that much lower, but anywhere in the f with a five handle, I think it's going to produce higher stock prices. Okay. We'll get more from Derek as we go along. The thing everybody's going to be fearful of is that the Asians won't recognize their problems. It's not really... We've had this Japan problem for a long time, and I think what investors really want to see is people stepping up to the plate and saying, okay, we've got a real problem. We've got to change this, 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 and this. If we don't have that, confidence probably is not going to go back to those markets. So that's a, great, that's a good thing. Well, I, I think that you, clearly the pattern will probably continue to exist. And as you just said, those are very difficult decisions to make, to swallow the pill now, to get it done. You know, I think you need an RTC lookalike to start taking down a lot of this bad debt start funding that new channel. I mean, sell it to the United States. All the guys who made all the money in the RTC stuff here, we'd probably be pretty willing to buy a lot of that from them. Gold got went in and bought a lot of real estate loans. I think Whitehall bought a lot. Yeah, so yeah, it's hard to stimulate anything that way. So it seems to me all, all you can do is take all that, a lot of that bad stuff that they, they don't even have workout lawyers. They don't, this is an industry that doesn't exist there. Take all that stuff, give it to the people who've already went through it or sell it to them, obviously, so to the United States, et cetera. Let them work out all the bad debt. Let them restructure everything. That would put liquidity into the system. Boom, you could probably be off and running again. They don't have workout lawyers there? I suppose it's not. It's, mm. it, it's an industry that doesn't exist. You know, you don't have... I smell an income. <laughs> Uh, actually, I was on the plane and I was reading that and I thought, oh, I'm gonna get better. I'm going to see a lot of friends now leaving Wall Street going into That would be a problem. But we think the economy is strong enough that you're not going to have that problem, but yet you can still have lower inflation and therefore lower interest rates. I'm not saying that interest rates are going to go that much lower, but anywhere in the, with a five handle, I think it's going to produce higher stock prices. Well, that proved to be right on the money. Well, we don't have a five handle anymore, though, so. Well, until two days ago, we did. <laughs> and uh, and you did get a rise in stock prices in the U.S., at least. How do you feel about things now? Okay, well, I think it gets a little more complicated now in the sense that, uh, obviously, interest rates have backed up. Uh, basically, people are looking for about 7% growth in earnings this year. Markets fairly valued, slightly overvalued on historical measures, i.e. PEs to inflation to interest rates. Um, I just think you're going to, in the short run, I think there's risk to the market, X the momentum. Uh, I can't, I'm not looking for spectacular gains in the U.S. anymore. Mm. I still think the market could go higher, but I don't think you're going to get big. I think you've gotten most of what you're going to get this year. Bomber, get them out of here. <laughs> we don't need this kind of stuff.
All right, let's get time. We'll, we'll get more from Derek, obviously, as we go along. He's going to be here all morning. Um, uh, if you look at, say, 200-day moving average, it's kind of a backward-looking indicator, and it does look great, obviously. Um, what do you think about, though, interest rate? Obviously, stocks trade on a couple different things, level of interest rates, the risk premium to the level of interest rates, and then theoretical earnings growth. Now, you might say they don't trade on those things at all, and none of that's important. The only thing that's important is technicals. But given that, um, what do you think about where interest rates are going? And the fact that, you know, uh, stocks are fairly slash valued slash to overvalued. Most people don't think earnings growth is going to be 7% this year. So are stocks just going to go to new highs? I mean, new valuations, or is it the new paradigm? And I'm not saying it is or isn't. Obviously, I don't know. But it is, First of all, in the interest rate environment, uh, fr from my perspective, the important thing about the interest rate environment is that it not be negative. No, it isn't. Does Derek have those glasses Those are in great shape. Do you remember when Kaminsky wore glasses? I mean, Derek, you don't need to increase your credibility. You're, you're a handsome man, but that's not helping us. <laughs> that, that doesn't increase your credibility well, with us. You look like Poindexter. The, the problem is people confuse me with you. So I, <laughs> I, I want to make sure that there's a very clear distinction that we do not look alike. With my son, maybe. So, so I went out and got these glasses. <laughs> Thanks, son. Uh, uh, yeah. Do you know why, you know, this stock sat there for a while, around 25 bucks, when everybody knew the company was for sale? I don't know. And, I, you know, I, I bought it, and a lot of people were, were saying, look, it's, it's going to happen. And I think maybe there was a liability problem with yeah. it, i.e., people thought that whoever bought it might have some liabilities of their own business, Looking into the books, yeah, what was really going on there. But uh, that, that was a very easy trade. Stock went from 20 to 25, sat at 25. Rumors were in the 30s, boom. Yeah, but although, Derek, were, there were concerns about overall the industry, and there still are in terms of these lenders. They're all, a lot of them are having a, a tough time. The money store, the least, perhaps, toughest among a, a very tough environment, right? That is true. That is true. That is true. We'll run through these other ones quickly, get them done. Uh, three commas upgraded Longer by term, deal. he's still very bullish, looking for 5% on the bond because of inflation and disinflation, et cetera. Well, we've been in this, you know, Cinderella period. You had this really low commodity prices, very strong dollar, and no labor problems. But as you say, you have to ask yourself, are we going to have a problem with labor eventually? Is the dollar going to go up forever? And are commodity prices going to continue to go lower? I think two out of three of those are probably not going to happen. So eh, I think you got to be cautious. Mm -hmm. as, as what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. We are back. Derek Webb, GT Global, the Prince of Liechtenstein. Bugging out? He's, uh, he's going to take his chips off the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he uh, sold the firm to Investcap, which is a $150 billion firm. We're $60 billion, so now we're going to be $220 billion, assuming the deal closes in May. Okay. Let's talk about some of the stocks you like here. Uh, we have, I think we have some graphs. Yeah. Pier 1. Pier 1. That makes sense logically. Okay. Well, let's, 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 What's let's, your reasoning? All right, let's go through this. It's pretty simple. Pier 1's uh, doing well for two reasons. A, everything it imports basically is from Southeast Asia and right. other parts like that. Import costs are going down. B, the domestic housing is, economy is very, very strong. So get the best of both worlds. Earnings have been going higher. It's got a reasonable. It's not cheap. It trades about 20, 22 times, but doing very well. Don't have a lot of new households being formed, though, in terms uh, of the demographics. No, you don't have to have new households. There's obviously a whole renovation issue. It's the post the, the storm activity, people redecorating their homes, et cetera. They got the cheapest stuff around, so. Dwayne Reed. Dwayne Reed. Just came public about a month ago, right? New York-based uh, drugstore chain. New York-based drugstore chain. It's probably got, uh, I think it's got the dirtiest stores in North America, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, know, I used to shop there, I remember. But anyway. Uh, Obviously, just came public. Um, what's going on here is the whole drugstore industry has been doing very, very well, mainly because of over-the-counter drugs. And the industry has been consolidating. So A, their business is just doing well fundamentally. New York economy is doing well. Over-the-counter drugs are doing well. And then B, you get the added kicker that there's a good chance that this company is going to get bought out. A lot of people want to get into the New York market. It's a very hard market to get into. Companies fully public right now. There's no controlling shareholder. Hmm. Okay. Cooper Cameron. Cooper Cameron. Oilfield. Uh, oil services, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, this one was not up 25% yesterday, but it was up. It was, up, it was up big, yeah. I think it was up four points. No, I'll tell you. Three or four points. Uh, Cooper Cameron makes uh, compressor equipment. Uh, and what's going on here, real simply, is that the more and more oil and gas wells that you drill, you need compression in everything. You need it in a well that you drill. You need it in an existing well. You need it in pipelines. You need, a, need it in the pipeline that brings it up here to New York City, et cetera. And one of the things that's interesting is that the decline curves are increasing everywhere. So the rate... What's a decline curve? 
The decline curve is when you drill an oil well or right. a gas well, right. it naturally declines the production every year because the pressure goes down in the well. So the pressure to push it to the surface goes down, therefore the amount that can come to the surface goes down. What you want to do is put compressors in there to keep the pressure high, to keep the production coming to the surface, to keep it going to your home, etc. So decline curves have been increasing, which means you need more pressure to, to slow the decline in the decline curves. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, very bullish and on they that. They make stuff in that. Uh, but haven't they you make heard, compressors. Yeah, but haven't you heard that oil is going to like $14 a barrel, and at that point... Okay. Let, let, me, let me talk about oil for one second, because I think this is very interesting. Oil over the last 15 years has averaged $20 a barrel. And I've always said one thing about oil. If oil's it's 16 below, you want to buy it. And if oil's 24 or higher, you probably want to sell it. It's very hard to com predict commodity prices. I don't think every year we're going to have an El Nino, an Asian meltdown, an Iraqi coming back on stream. Clearly right now, there's too much oil in the world. And if there's one extra barrel, you have low prices. If there's one too few barrels, you have high prices. Right now, we have one extra barrel, we have low prices. But I think here's an interesting thing. If you say, can, do you, can you make the assumption that oil's just going to trade at the average price $20 over the next three years? Oil service stocks are off 50% from their highs, not because of what's going on in the businesses, but because of the decline in hydrocarbon prices. Now, if you just go back to normal oil, $30 a barrel, let's say it happens three years from now, let's say these stocks go back to their old highs, forgetting all the growth that's going to take place between now and then, that's a 100% increase in these stocks. So, yeah, right now, this quarter, next quarter, I'm not sure you're going to make money necessarily in these, but if you can make any kind of window at all, I think the risk reward's pretty good. You also like USG? U.S. Gypsum. U.S. Gypsum, in fact, is the only company I can see right now that has a commodity price that's actually going up. It is. Yeah. I've noticed. Yeah, there you go. I've noticed it on Depot. doing some remodeling? Yes. Okay. I'm constantly remodeling. <laughs> Bought a dump. Duh. Needs a lot of work. <laughs> well, then you've been doing a lot of wallboard. Yep. U.S. Gypsum makes gypsum. Gypsum goes into wallboard. Wallboard's what goes on your wall. Uh, it's an oligopoly in this business. There's three guys. I think they've raised prices three or four times in the last two years. Mm -hmm. Housing starts strong, remodeling strong, oligopoly in the industry. I guess I shouldn't say that word on television. Or I know Bill Gates didn't say monopoly once last night. Uh, long story short, price is going higher. Stock has a very reasonable valuation. Okay. Up later, we're going to hit the road. With a, a tremendous degree of confidence in our company. As I said before, Apollo owns about 30% of the shares of our company. Adam, Der Derek Webb. Um, American Ski Company and Interwest, as I recall, I think their companies are roughly 50-50 operating ski mountains and, and real estate. Can you just break down how your company comes out in those two and what both segments are doing? Sure. Uh, our company is much more focused on operating world-class resorts than our real estate business. Yes, sir. Doesn't it uh, scare you that revenue, you see revenues tailing off in, in ABC and expenses aren't in this stuff. Isn't it skyrocketing? All the stuff I read in... It's kind of a local press with all these sitcoms and what oh, these yeah. things cost, et cetera. I mean, the margins, you just think you've got to get crushed in this business. Yeah, I mean, I'm ABC, and I, you know, Derek, I haven't looked at specific numbers. I'm not even yeah. sure Disney So, So, Michael, Derek Webb, hey, have Derek. earnings been accelerating? What always confuses me about the autos is they're always cheap. You know, you read every research <laughs> report. They're always cheap. They're always buys. Right. You know, the multiples are too low. Cash flow is building up in these things in a big way. Dividend yields are higher in the market. And I always get confused because... You know, you never know when to buy them. So now they've right. broken out. And so I'm curious, why have they broken out? I guess you just said that. Right. But then, is there, what's the fundamental reason? Is there a fundamental reason behind them, or is it just change in perception, in your opinion? Well, I, I think when you look at the auto stocks over the last 20 years, the best way to make money with, in the group has been to get out in front of a shift in sentiment. Uh -huh. Michael, clearly, though, we must be somewhere near the, the end of this. The only reason I say that is, I remember the first book I ever read yeah. was Peter Lynch's book. Was it One right. Up on Wall Street? We had that great chart where he shows, you know, car sales do this over time, but then, That's or right. actually car demand, but then car sales are kind of doing this thing. Mm -hmm. And we must now have crossed that line, and, and uh, the average age of cars is very, very low, and I realize financing rates are low, and oil prices are low, and so on and so forth. But if you look at that, we must be somewhere in the latter innings here. Well, you know, that's the interesting question. I think if you go back out of... Uh, 30 seconds, Derek. Well, I haven't asked you about Canada. At least have to get your, uh, your feel, your funds up in Canada not doing that well. Uh, what's your well, feel? they're on the TSC. TSC hasn't been doing that well. Yeah. It's lagging. Um, still bullish. Bottom line is it, it follows the U.S. Low inflation, low interest rates. Uh, interest rates actually are lower in Canada than they are in the U.S. They've actually traded through the U.S. they got a balanced budget, but a real balanced budget, not a uh, paper...